Well, good morning. Welcome to Redeemer's Easter service. It is good to have you here with us this morning. Uh, even though we can't gather together, uh, we can still be together uh, through this live stream. And that is the beauty of the church. Though the church building is empty today, uh, the church is still alive and connected. And we're rejoicing because the tomb itself was empty over 2,000 years ago. If you're tuning in and you're a guest or you'd like to share a prayer request on our website, RedeemerPCA.com, and if you go to the live page, there's a digital guest card. You can let us know if you'd like to talk to us about something, if you have a need. Uh, we're still seeking to carry out our mission to help people know and follow Jesus. And so uh, if you have a physical need, an emotional need, a spiritual need, please reach out to us. We would love to hear from you uh, and share prayer requests as well. Um, something that's, I think, been helpful so we don't feel alone is grabbing your phone or your device and just texting someone. Uh, I encourage you to text two or three people and welcome them. Uh, invite them to rejoice. Join us this, uh, during this service. I'm just texting out to one of the text threads I have, Christ is risen. Um, though we're gathered, I have to tell you, this doesn't feel like a normal Easter. Uh, it's been really hard, to be quite honest. Um, I think we're feeling shock. Um, we're disoriented. We feel alone, isolated, um, surprised by the events of this life. And I think it may be one of the first times we have a sense of what those women felt on the way to the tomb. Uh, things were uh, just, they were distraught, they were grieving, and they went uncertain of what the future would hold. And so as we begin this morning, before we do the call to worship, <clears throat> I want us to sing a song that uh, you may know. It's called God Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. And the original tune had kind of a triumphant victory march. This new tune has a bit of a lament, a longing. And I think we can resonate with that longing this morning. And so I want us to sing this song asking the Lord to guide us in the midst of this brokenness and uncertainty that we're facing now and own that and grasp it and sing it together. But then we can take the call to worship, be reminded that Christ is our King and do our typical Easter, Christ is risen, He is risen indeed, and allow that to speak to the longing that we're feeling right now. The, the fact that we can't gather as a church family or with friends, uh, to have a celebration, a great meal this afternoon with other people. We're going to be alone in that one sense, and yet with Christ, the risen Lord, and with each other as the church, uh, we can rejoice and be together. So let's sing this song of lament and of faith together. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Let the fire and clouds 
we can make that song, which is a prayer in faith, because Christ is the King of glory who's come, who's risen from the dead. So we can take our fears about life and death, about our finances, about our loneliness, and we can cry out and know that God will answer them. Let me call us to worship from Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10. If you're at home and want to stand up and follow our pattern, please do so. I invite you to respond in the bold. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's continue to worship the Lord as we sing praises back to him. Christ the Lord is risen today. sing together of the only place our hope is found in Jesus. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, 
What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone, who took on flesh Fullness of God Friends, that is the hope of the gospel. This is the good news that we celebrate each and every Sunday in Christ. Every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and the hope that is ours through him who took on flesh that he might give his very life and satisfy the wrath of God. As we sang the last part, no power of hell, no scheme of man can pluck us from his hand. And saying that here I'm standing in the power of Christ, I don't know about you, but there have been moments this week where I haven't stood in the power of Christ. Where my fears and anxieties, uh, my concerns, my selfishness have won. And I've forgotten all that is mine in Christ Jesus. And you may have felt that as well. Uh, Our typical pattern in our service of worship is to take some time to confess our sin. And we don't do this to beat ourselves up. We don't do this to to make ourselves have some kind of false spirituality, but to be honest with ourselves and say, God, here's where I've let you down, where I've let myself down, where I've sinned against you this week. And then we apply the good news of the gospel to us through words of pardoning grace. This week is from Romans chapter 5. So let me lead us together in a time of confession. Father, we have these incredible riches in Christ Jesus. Not only have you forgotten our sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west, you have given us full and rich life now. And yet so often in the midst of busyness or now in what can often feel like boredom, in the midst of being fearful about finances, or our health, or the health of those we love, 
we forget the power that we have in Jesus. I do. And so this morning we confess that many times this week we have not lived in faith but in fear. We have lost our sense of awe and wonder that Jesus was raised from the dead. We have feared death when you've already removed the sting of death and it shouldn't bring fear anymore because while to live is Christ, to die, as Paul said, really is a gain. Joy in your presence with your people for eternity. Lord, we confess too that we've run to other places for escape and comfort. Places that don't actually bring life but entrap us and lead us away from you. Father, forgive us for loving the things you've created more than loving you. And we do ask that in this time of staying at home and feeling locked in, that you would be doing amazing things in our souls as we think about why we are here and what you ask of us. So again, Father, thank you that you love us, that we can be honest with where we fall short and you don't shame or scold us because Christ has taken our shame and our guilt and set us free. That is the message of Christianity. That is the good news of Jesus, that he died in our place, that we could be your adopted sons and daughters. Father, thank you for this good news that we celebrate together this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hear these great words of pardoning grace from Romans chapter 5. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will rarely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person he might be willing to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. That is the good news of the gospel. Good morning. I'm Ken Coyer, one of the deacons here at Redeemer. And this is the time during our service when we would normally continue worshiping and pass the tithe and offering plates. We're not able to do so as these are different times, but God's word is nonetheless true. So I would like to read some of his word so that it might stick in our hearts. This is from Deuteronomy 16:17. It says, Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, that he has given you. And finally, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8 says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. God wants our hearts, and he desires us to cheerfully give. And while the plate can't be passed this morning, thankfully there are other means by which we can cheerfully give and help to keep Redeemer strong. First, you can drop off cash or check at the church office during the week, and we just ask that uh, you call first before you do so to make sure somebody's there. You can also drop it in the mailbox that's out front. You can also give via a text. And, and finally, you can simply mail check into the church. All of these options are shown at the Redeemer website as well. I'm thankful that there are still means by which we can worship our God in this way. Let's pray. Lord, you desire for us to give out of a cheerful heart and we thank you for the different means by which we can do so. Give us a great desire to worship you in this way and use the funds provided to bring you blessing and honor. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Sing together of his goodness towards us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.
Good morning and welcome. He is risen. He is risen indeed. It is a blessing to be able to join you here today, here in the sanctuary, as well as through uh, the live stream, so that we may worship our resurrected Lord. I'm Dan Kemp, one of the elders serving you here at Redeemer. This morning I'll be uh, reading and Pastor Dan will be uh, bringing us the message from the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. I'll be reading the first eight verses. And as is our custom here at Redeemer, I ask that those of you here and at home, please rise, if you are able, in honor of God's word. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. He said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. God's word, it is forever true. Please be seated. It is also my privilege to offer prayer for the kingdom and for the needs of the church. Please join me in that prayer. Heavenly Father, as we gather today, along with millions of other Christians throughout this world, to celebrate Christ's resurrection, we are also focused on a planet-wide epidemic which is altering our daily lives in dramatic ways. As we wrestle with the life-threatening aspects of this virus, let us also consider the Christ-centered potential of caring for those around us who are in need of physical and emotional support. Our current condition compels us to look both inward and close at hand to identify the needs of others and, where we are able, to serve those needs. May we use these opportunities to reflect the love of Christ to those around us that we may not have had the time to serve before. Lord, as we look ahead to a time when we are not preoccupied and consumed by the distraction of COVID-19, fill us with a knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that we may live and conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of you, fully pleasing to you and being fruitful in every good work. Lord, we are blessed beyond measure that you sent your son to live among us and to ultimately pay the price for our sins that we could not pay. He is the cornerstone of our salvation, and his finished work is the foundation on which our hope rests. Now to you who are able to do far more than all we ask or imagine, according to your power that is at work within us, we lift up these prayers of petition and thanksgiving, confident that they will be answered in your own time and in your own manner. Lord, we pray for the ongoing efforts by this nation and its leaders to navigate the perilous waters that coronavirus has created. We pray for all those suffering the effects of this disease, and we give thanks for all the caregivers that constantly expose themselves to the ravages of this disease as they render care and comfort to those desperately in need. We ask your protection and guidance for those in elective office or called to serve in this struggle. 
May they be fruitful in their service, and may they always understand it is the care of your kingdom with which they are entrusted. Lord, we pray your care of those who are expecting or seeking to become pregnant or to adopt, and we give thanks for the arrival of Violet Ann Smith and other recent safe deliveries. May these covenant children come to know what a mighty and loving father you are. Lord, we pray your blessing on our marriages, our families, and our relationships with each other, especially with those who do not yet know you. We lift up your continued he for your continued healing touch those in this congregation who are suffering from a variety of medical challenges. For Kelly, for Murray, for BJ, for Susan, and for others that we now name silently. We pray for the ministries of this church and all who are serving. We give thanks for our pastors and staff and their faithful service to each of us. Lord, we pray for the church universal and all those engaged in its ministry. We pray for the persecuted church in the Middle East and in Asia and seek your protection of all who worship and serve you. We pray for all our missionaries throughout this world. We pray specifically for the, the Gildarts, the Ebies, the Shaws, the Hastings, the Newkirks, and all those laboring in various parts of Asia. Finally, as we receive the preached word this morning through your servant, Dan, may we be given ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to respond, all of which we ask in the name of your risen Son. Amen. strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me your all in all jesus paid it all all to him i owe sin have left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow
But you may want to grab your Bible or turn to a device to Mark chapter 16. Uh, Mark is a gospel that is kind of one of the briefest, and he's always uh, saying a lot of things in a very few words. So before we look at that, let me ask for the Lord to bless our time together. Father, help us to internalize what we've just sung the truth of what Christ has accomplished for us and what it means for us each and every day. Lord, it is sad when the celebration of the resurrection just happens once a year or once a week. Lord, may we celebrate and stand in awe and fear and wonder of the resurrection each and every day. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Shock, fear, uncertainty. All those words can describe what we've felt maybe these last few weeks, but they really describe the heart of the followers of Jesus. In fact, if you look at all four Gospels, the stories uh, telling about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, whether it's in Matthew or Mark, Luke or John, the number one word to describe what went on that day was fear. The guards were terrified when the angels were there. The disciples who saw and found the empty tomb were fearful and amazed and ran away in wonder. They use other words like perplexed, frightened. And as we come into this passage, I I want us to hopefully long for those emotions. And that seems dissonant with what we're feeling. Those aren't the emotions we want to feel. Right now, we want certainty, security, um, confidence. And those, I think, come from this passage as well. But this passage is showing us we need wonder and fear of the risen Christ every day of our lives. But let's try to get into setting with these ladies. And I think it's interesting. There are no men there. I mean, they didn't expect a resurrection. We sometimes think, you know, they're, they were early people, believers. I mean, they were superstitious. So, of course, they assumed some supernatural act like this. They didn't expect the resurrection. Even though in the Gospel of Mark, the last several chapters, in each chapter, he said, I'm going to die and I'll be raised again on the third day. Here it is, the third day. And the men disciples, they can't be found anywhere. And these ladies were going to do a job out of love. They were going to anoint the body of someone they loved who was dead. They were grieving, and yet they were continuing to press forward out of love towards Jesus. But they realized at some point along the way that there was a problem. There was going to be this huge rock that needed to be rolled away. And yet they pressed on And can you imagine what they began to feel when they saw the stone was rolled away? What would they have thought? They weren't thinking, he's risen. They might have been thinking, who broke in? Did some of the mob come and steal his body? What happened to our blessed Savior? And they go in and they it says they saw someone sitting there dressed in a white robe. Another one of the Gospels says it was like he had lightning. And so you can understand why he has to say, hey, don't be alarmed. I don't know if you saw someone like that. You would be terrified. They were confused. This isn't what they anticipated life to be. It was a shock to their system. And listen to the angel's reply. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, he's telling them what they're doing. He's telling them that they don't need to be afraid. And then he says the most crazy thing. He's risen. He's not here. They can see that he's not there anymore, but but what does he mean that he's risen? And then I love this tenderness by the angel. Instead of, don't you realize he told you this a lot of times? He says, but I want you to go and tell the disciples that he's going before you to Galilee. Then you're going to see him just as he told you. I need that gentle reminder instead of just the the stern rebuke. To be reminded of what God has told us is true. These 
ladies need to be told what was true. We get that. This story makes sense so far. But listen to verse 8. This is typically the end of the Gospel of Mark. I know most of your Bibles has other passages, but you'll notice it says most of the early manuscripts don't include this. See, I think Mark's Gospel ends here at verse 8 and is really awkward and disconcerting. And that's why I think along the way people came and tried to to add endings borrowing from some of the other Gospels. This is the end of the Gospel of Mark. They went out, they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Why would he end his story this way? Well, it's because of how he started the whole story. The whole reason Mark wrote his book was to answer, have you answer the question, who is Jesus? And as these women run, terrified that Jesus is risen, shocked at this good news, and yet it's disrupted their entire understanding of life. He wants that to happen to you, the reader. So what do you think about? Who do you think Jesus is? I mean, I think a lot of us would say he's at least a good teacher. He's a prophet. Those who believe his own claims would say that he's God, that he's the Savior, that he's the risen Savior. But let me ask you a different question. What does your heart do with the emotions when you are asked the question, who is Jesus? Let me ask you another question. It gets at it just a slightly different way, but what difference does the resurrection make to your daily life? I think particularly here in the West, many of us at least have heard of Jesus and know, at least we think we know what the message of the Gospel is. Usually we think Christianity is a message of be good and often comes across as self-righteousness. This is how you should live and I'm going to point out how wrong you are. That's not the message of Christianity. I think for some of us, we know the facts. We know that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, that His followers say He was crucified and buried and on the third day He rose again. But for some, it just stops there at the intellectual. And I think what Mark wants us to do is not only to grasp the fact that what Jesus said about Himself was true and He proved it by His resurrection, but that it would cause fear in our hearts and wonder. And that that fear and wonder would then change how we live every day. See, Mark, when he wrote about Jesus, he would often use that word fear. And If you go through the Gospel, you'll see that people see Jesus do these amazing things. He's walked on water. He's cured the blind. He's healed the sick. He's made the lame to walk. He, he's even raised people from the dead. And every time, they people were hit with fear. They were seized with this awe Jesus caused people to tremble because of the incredible, life-changing, altering power He had. Is that what Jesus does in your life? See, if we celebrate Easter and just once a year, or even as in our tradition, we celebrate Resurrection Sunday every Sunday, we are missing something. We need to recognize that every day we need to be awed and astonished by the resurrection. But a lot of things get in the way of that, don't they? One of them that usually gets in the way has been less true for many of us is busyness. I know some of you who are trying to stay home, uh, you're staying home from work and you're trying to work and help your kids get classes online and figure all that out. In some ways it feels busier. In some ways my days are busier, but my nights are a little quieter. But busyness often just drowns out things we don't want to think about or, or wrestle with.
Who is Jesus? And what does He stir in your heart? And what does He cause you to do? See, Mark wants all those things to come together, not just an intellectual and intellectual knowledge of who Jesus claims to be, and not just mere emotion and sentiment that makes you um, think of Jesus as some kind of warm fuzzy, but that He's the Lord, that as you know Him and are moved by this awe for Him, it changes how you live. Then there's this wonder, too, of the resurrection. Remember, they didn't anticipate, sure, some of the early Jews had some vague notion of a resurrection, but they didn't believe in this bodily resurrection necessarily, like how Jesus was raised from the dead, so they were shocked. But by Jesus' resurrection, the words He said on the cross when He said and cried out, it is finished, He essentially is saying, I have paid in full the debt of all My people. Their sins are forgiven. They are given new life now and future life forever. And See, one of the things that means for us that should strike this awe and wonder is that the worst day of your future, your ultimate future is spending glory and joyous time in the presence of God with the people of God. Not playing harps and just doing nothing, but in the new creation, enjoying the creation He's made, but ultimately in it for His glory. And I know there's a lot of fear about what tomorrow holds. What we might lose. But see, the hope of the resurrection says whatever we might lose now is nothing compared to what we're going to gain then. And if we're honest, what we have now in Him really is enough. See, the problem is we get caught up really in loving these incredibly good things He gives us here more than loving Him. I mean, it's not unlike if you, if you give a gift to your child and they love and adore the gift, and then they go off and they start playing with it and get lost up in that, never say thank you. There's something that, that aches a little bit. You want them to delight in the fact that you've given them gifts, not just the gift itself. Because you're giving them the gift because you love them. And the joy of that gift comes full circle when they're able to say thank you and be able to rejoice, not only in the gift, but in the acknowledgement of your relationship. See, daily we need to be connected to the resurrected Jesus, as we remind ourselves that this is an amazing, glorious, miraculous, mysterious truth. But it changes not only how I feel, but how I should live out my life. Because here's the thing, and Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, if Jesus is raised from the dead, it changes everything. But if it's just a lie, if it's not true, then we are the most foolish of all people. But if Jesus really has done what He said He did, is Mark's account is true, that the true and perfect King came and died in our place, then it should reorient how we think about all of life. The words that Jesus said in John 11, that I'm the resurrection and life, and he who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die, means this, that Jesus' death means there's no death for us. His resurrection means our resurrection. This is at the heart of the good news of the Gospel. Now you may still be doubting. You may have heard these truths, but haven't been able to say, yeah, but but what if it's not true? I do want you to think about this. Before and after Jesus' life, there were dozens of other people who claimed to be the Messiah. But almost all of them died, many through execution, and with their death died their revolution. But friends, after Jesus' death is when this good news when Christianity began to spread all over the world. Mark has made a clear point throughout, particularly on his death, of these people who saw him dead, the centurion, Pilate, making sure that he was dead. He's saying, look, there's historical fact here. I want you to explore and look at these people but not only are these, there are these witnesses, there's the testimony of these disciples who were terrified. But then after Jesus' resurrection, they became bold when these men and women were willing to live and die for Jesus. Willing to give up finances. Willing to risk security and safety so that others might know Jesus. 
I encourage you, if you're still wrestling and you don't know, reach out to me uh, through Facebook, through text, whatever, however you can get hold of me. Talk to a friend. Because I want you to know the joy that can come from knowing Christ so that He can bid your anxious fears farewell. That you can cast them aside. See, again, the truth of this resurrection, if it's true, it changes everything. If not, I am wasting my time. But as I look throughout history and as I look at my own life, I know that this is true. Christ died for His people. He died for me. He died for you that you might know Him and have life in its fullness. I want that for you. Not just once a week. Not just once a year. I want you daily to rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus. But again, busyness, and let's be honest, adulthood shrink our wonder. Because as adults, what are we supposed to do? As you're going through school, you're being taught and given tools so that you can become proficient at something, that you can begin to make a living and an earning and learn how to live life and be in relationship, and you need proficiency and skill and to master something. And that is good, yet when we master something, some of it loses its awe. It's no longer, no longer this amazing thing about how it works. But you can explain how it works. You understand it and its intricacies. And as we lose this wonder, whether it's for how music works or how electricity works or how video works or even just the, how you understand photosynthesis and how a tree works and you harvest this tree and build a table and it loses its awe. But what restores our awe? Eugene Peterson said one of the things that really does restore our awe is Sabbath, rest. And he talks about the pattern, how God set aside one day a week, we stop. We stop doing everything we know how to do really well and remind ourselves that we are created by God for God. So there's this weekly pattern God puts in our lives to help fill us with awe, how we gather with others to remind ourselves of the Gospel story. We, we do that ourselves in our daily meeting with the Lord and remind ourselves of who He is and what He's done for us. Because here's the thing. Here's what happens. Is if we treat our spiritual life like everything else we do, I mean, everything else we try to succeed in, we prepare, we plan, we discipline ourselves. But when you carry that over without feeding awe and wonder by your communion with Jesus, you begin to get anxiety and guilt. Anxiety, am I doing enough? Am I reading the Bible enough? Do I go to Bible studies? Do I go to church? And you get anxious, am I doing enough? And then you begin to feel guilty because you don't think you're doing enough. And it actually undermines the very spiritual growth that God would have us flourish on by sitting and wondering in awe of His resurrection. And when the wonder gets squeezed out of us, religion becomes like anything else. Just something we're trying to do in our own strength. So who is Jesus? Do you have a sense of awe and wonder? And where has it gone? Sometimes those who have been in church the longest can have the most knowledge and yet sometimes the most cold heart. How do we fuel that heart? By bringing the tinder of God's Word and fanning into flame this truth by sitting in the Word and reminding ourselves of the resurrection. That all of God's promises from Genesis to Revelation are fulfilled and completed because of the resurrection of Jesus. Friends, I can't tell you what a mistake we make if we just celebrate this one day a year, one day a week. So what do I hope you'll walk away with? Something I can't do. A renewed awe and reverence for the Lord Jesus, the risen One, that can only come by His Spirit through His Word. I wish I could stir that up into you. There's things that can. You may have seen it. I just watched it this morning. There's this 90-second video. Uh, I think I posted it on my Facebook page this morning. And it says, what if the resurrection happened today? And you begin to see people from different places in the world, their phones begin to buzz. And there's this text. And you see 
uh, a lady in Africa dancing because he is risen. You see a, a teenager saying, dude, I told you this was going to happen. You see people in Asia and around the world rejoicing that Christ is risen. There's this, I have to admit, I, and you're not surprised if you know me, I began to, to get a little teary-eyed because there was this emotion. Hardly any, no words were said. Hardly, but there was this joy that came. This awe, this wonder that Jesus is alive. That's what I want you to walk away with this morning. That's what we need to know. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing a song that's one of my favorites about how His love won't let us go. Because what happens, at least for me, is I begin to say, God, where are you? Do you love me? Why aren't you working in this craziness? And I forget. And I begin to manage life. Not out of fear and wonder of God, but this fear of circumstance. Let me pray. Father, do what I can't do. Stir in my heart and in the hearts of everyone listening a wonder for You. That You loved us so much You sent Your Son to take our place. And sin and death could not conquer Him. But He conquered sin and death in the grave and sits at Your right hand. And all Your promises are fulfilled in Him. So fill us with wonder and awe that we might live for You, the resurrected King. That we might bow our lives before You and say, Lord, use me for Your glory. That is the only thing that will keep us oriented around You. Lord, help us to fight against busyness and being able to explain and master life on our own. Give us humility and let us believe that You will never let us go. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.